So that's what the other appeal that I'm trying to make to you all is if you see someone blatantly, egregiously violating our code, I'm asking you all to file that complaint. It is, it, it is so important that we, we keep these bad apples out. You know? Um, my opinion is one of the reasons we have that the, the public has such a low opinion of attorneys is because attorneys aren't doing that. Attorneys aren't policing themselves. And I'd be the first person to say that we probably maybe we should even have a state agency over over overseeing us. Because clearly I get a magazine that shows me why people get you know letters of reprimand and suspended. Now we're talking egregious stuff. How about how about taking people's money and not doing anything? And that person losing, losing property, losing, you know. I mean, instances where lawyers, again, are very egregiously doing and, and nothing is said. And, and, and lawyers are getting slaps on the wrist. You can't have that, you know. When I talk to people, just my own acquaintances, my own friends, they still have a very high opinion of realtors, a very favorable opinion of realtors, a very positive experience, you know. Let's let's keep that up. Let's keep that up. And with that, I guess I'll open the floor to some questions. Yes, sir. Uh, two quick questions. Talking about <coughs> in interfering the business relationship. Mm -hmm. What I what I heard is when a bar comes to an open house, the first question is, "Do you have an agent?" Yes. And the question is, "Did you sign anything?" Right. No, yes. we didn't. How does TAR on the law? How much weight do you give to implied agency? In the textbook, we teach about implied agency. I mean, but in reality out there, people don't, don't, don't understand it or don't preach it too much uh, because they don't have anything in, in writing, right. even though there's an implied agency there. You know, two agents still stay away from that type, which I think is the right thing to do. Yes. Most of the agent, hey, if you got nothing in writing, come on, I show you how to, even well, though the body is close. And it was, it, you know, Scott and I were having a conversation about, and Scott, can you, can you tell everyone about the New Mexico way of, of doing agency, which I think is probably the better way of doing it. In New Mexico, there is no implied agency. For those classes in New Mexico, y'all know that. There is no implied agency. You are a transaction broker. The only time there is agency is it expressed. You sign a separate agency addendum. Uh, track might not enforce implied agency but the code of ethics does because like he said if they say i'm working with an agent is it in writing they've already said they're working with an agent you don't have to do your due diligence because they've already said they're working with an agent so it's hands off but in new mexico there is no implied agency and i you know i think every, all agencies should be in writing but we still have an implied agency so are you working with an agent yes there's your due diligence right there anything beyond that i think you're interfering but i'm not an attorney <laughs> I concur. <laughs> Again, I mean, the, the whole thing with, I mean, they, 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 they did that also with, okay, for instance, when you all call the legal hotline, a lot of times people will ask the lawyers to review <coughs> documents, you know? And, and again, there's, there's also implied agency in, in the law. So if some if, if an attorney reviews documents for you, even though you're not, even though we're not being paid, that would be seen as we are acting as your attorney, and any repercussions from that would fall on the lawyer. They actually had to make a special exception, a statutory exception for legal offices, you know, and. I, I don't say that as, as often as, let's say, Tom. Tom says it like almost in every conversation. I am not your lawyer. I am not your lawyer. I am not your lawyer. <laughs> the only time I'll say it is if someone asks me to do something that I know is, is, is crossing the boundary. But yeah, Tom, Tom right, right off the bat, before he even starts, I'll tell you, hey, I'm not your lawyer. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I have a question, and it probably has to do with, you know, fidelity. Well, you are you're the listing agent and another agent calls you saying they represent the buyer. Will you pay me more commission if I sell your house? How can they be representing their client when they're trying to get the buyer to sell? And they never sell it anyway, but they won't shut up unless you Okay. Yeah. I'm okay, I'm glad you brought that up. Okay. 
that, that, that's been something that has, has been fought. And I was a hearing officer, but essentially almost what, word for word what you said, the same situation. And the complaint was filed by, by the listing, right? Because the broker had said, hey, if you don't pay this commission, I'm not even gonna show yeah. you know, the property or something like that, right? And then so the, the complaint is filed. And I was real curious on how the panel would decide this. Because they, unless the person's really, you know, careless, they're not gonna put it in right. I will not show your properties. <laughs> right? <laughs> or are they? <laughs> Apparently if you are that careless. Yeah, stick around. <laughs> but most of the time it will just be done orally. Yeah. And it's, so you have the, situ the situation where it was really one person's word against the other. And again, even though I know that the panel felt that this person was doing that, they did not find it in violation. I always ask them who they're representing themselves or their client, please hang up on me. <laughs> And then they don't show, and then did you do your job for your seller? See, all of these ethical quandaries that you all find yourselves in on a daily basis, right? Because there's a lot of that. Scott? Totally changing gears. Even though all mortgage companies basically ignore the moratorium, mm -hmm. do you feel that they have put the process in slow motion, holding properties until the robo signatures can be verified within their own bank before releasing them. Because even though only two have complied, right. it certainly seems like the flow has stopped. I mean, are y'all hearing that, that the ones that have complied are doing internal reviews? Well, they're, they're, they are, they're, 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 they're stating that, but to what extent, you know? So you, you're saying that here in El Paso, it's slow. I mean, we're, we were told in, in the Dallas market, there's probably between 4,500 and 6,000 properties that have been foreclosed on and in shadow inventory. The banks are not releasing, going back, checking out, crossing T's, whatever. Are y'all hearing the same thing? Or, and, because we've had a huge just slow down in the process of foreclosures to market where some companies we worked with, they were from the time foreclosure was on the market within seven days. Wow. And we haven't had any in three weeks. So I'm just wondering are, are other areas, even though they ignored it, are they paying attention to it? Absolutely. Again, the, the biggest thing that, that they're they're fearing of is that this the attorney general would file that injunction. Because if you file that injunction, it would it would completely freeze up the market in terms of foreclosures. So I think it, it's in a show of good faith, right, to the Attorney General, who does have that power, by doing this, you know, everyone can take a step back and try to figure <coughs> everything out before they proceed either way. Okay, follow up. This is uh, very politically incorrect. All right. But if we had the foreclosure process that went to the judge instead of through the deed of trust, mm -hmm. don't you think money being loaned in Texas for housing would be a lot harder. Absolutely. So even though we have the judicial process, oh. the trust, it certainly protects the bank's investment <laughs> yes. in loaning money in our deed, community. Deed of, yes, deed of trust. Okay. No, I, I didn't want to speak ill of you. No, okay. they were a great instrument. They really were. And all those things that, that it's true, but they do like like Scott says have have these little these little repercussions that you're not even aware of. You know, if it's hard to foreclose on properties, banks are going to raise lending standards, right? Everything has everything is, is intertwined with one another. And if they raise their lending standards, that means less people buying homes, less people being able to qualify to buy homes. Yes, ma'am. I have I have a triple question. Yeah. Okay. I heard that uh, they're going to eliminate Freddie and Fanny. I have heard nothing of that. I, I don't believe that. <laughs> let me let me tell you why I don't believe that they would do that. There are, there is no secondary market right now for mortgages because they're not good investments. <laughs> so because, because 
because they're not good investments, the, the buyer of last resort <coughs> is the government. What's the government doing right now? The Federal Reserve is buying worthless paper right now. And they're doing it deliberately to keep long-term interest rates low. So I do not believe that they would eliminate the Fed. <coughs> but next question. Uh, can anybody that lost their houses through foreclosure, mm -hmm. and now they are saying that it was not done properly, retrospectively can uh, demand their house back? They can demand it. I don't see how it would be, I, I, I just don't see how pragmatically and practically that could work here. Again, the problem is, like Scott and I were talking this morning, in the old days, you had your little SNL savings and loan that would make the mortgage, and they would hold on to the payments. And everyone knew who the mortgage holder was, right? Everyone knew. But with this, with all these financial derivatives, you know, they, they split it up into a thousand pieces. So we don't know. So I'll ask yourself this question. If that were to happen, what would, what would be the repercussions to Pension funds. I mean, everything is so intertwined that I maybe monetary damages, but the actual house itself, I, I just don't see it being plausible. You know. This money, you know how they are about everything, right? Mm -hmm. And if they have an inkling that maybe these bank-owned properties were not acquired properly it might get tougher to get title insurance on those. So I think that could have a and also that was a question that, was, that will be addressed, or like I said, that, that webinar that, we're, that the lawyers are gonna to listen to on Friday, I will assure you all that by Monday or Tuesday, you all will receive all the information that we got. Of course, we'll, we'll, we'll simplify it, you know, and, and get rid of all the legal jargon and mumbo jumbo. But yes, again, we, I will assure you that the TAR is on top of it, and we'll continue to inform you. Of course, you all also have that duty to, to check what we send you. Is Do you suggest anything for the buyers to protect themselves if they buy one of those orders? Is there anything that they can do? Uh, well, I would say don't buy a foreclosed home. <laughs> well, you don't want to be 100% safe. Resale. I, 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 you got to be careful with saying that. You're right, I know, I know. Well, that, my time is up. Uh, again, I, I, okay, Mr. Wolf, another question. Um, I know that the <coughs> is getting rid of all the realtors after 2011, and every oh, sorry, what's that? In the state of Illinois, they're getting rid of all the realtors, and every realtor that is in right now is going to have to have their own broker's license. You know, wow. Realtors is a You mean, you mean salesperson license? Salesperson license. Okay, that's different than a realtor. Are you familiar with I, I have not heard about that. Anyway, that's a good question. Yeah. 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 But you have a broker that you have a designated broker, which in terms of the licensee versus broker. Uh, it's just a change of semantics and words. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of necessarily having to call the legal hotline, because you can generally find answers to a lot of that stuff. Cool. Yes. <laughs> and, then, and also, we have a legal FAQ section that and has the FAQ. The but, FAQ that has great but the launch FAQ. site of the new uh, 2.0 is not until October 29th. It's going to be great. 